All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jennifer Johnson. I'm the Stakeholder Relations Coordinator for the Safety Codes Council, and you are in the National Energy Code for Buildings webinar. So hopefully that's where you wanted to be this morning. We've got uh, just a few housekeeping things before we get started. I want to let everybody know that today's presentation will be recorded. So we do ask people to turn your cameras off just because everything will be online later on. Um, we do have a maximum for these events of 100 that we're able to host. So often we have to turn people away as we did with this one. So we do offer them on our website. So it'll be up there within a week or two if you want to let anybody know afterwards. Uh, it'll be on there for anybody who didn't have a chance to make it today. We also have all of our participants muted just with this many people here. We often have, uh, we don't want the background noise and stuff like that to distract from the presentation. So we do have a chat feature down below there and you can put in any questions that you have throughout the presentation and uh, our presenters will be happy to address those. Afterwards, we'll send out a little bit of a survey. So pass along please any feedback that you have. Again, we've been doing these for about half a year now. So any feedback on the registration process, maybe topics that you'd like to see upcoming, uh, we're excited to, to keep improving it as we go. So we're happy for the feedback. Your presenters today will be Justin Phil, a senior engineer with the city of Edmonton and a specialist in green building and energy code. As well, we've got Nabil Habashi, the energy code specialist, energy building code specialist with the government of Alberta. So experts in the field, and I'm sure you'll find their presentation very, very interesting. Before we get started, uh, I want to let everybody know that you will be able to receive continuing education credit. So we have got Arena here with our certification team, and she's just going to give you a quick demo on how you can self-report those credits after today. So once you're completed, she'll show you how you can go through online and uh, make sure that you get those credits. So I will pass it over to Arena. Go ahead. Thank you, Jennifer. So I'm, I'm sure that at this point, um, everyone is more or less familiar with the continuing education program that we have in place. Um, and so, uh, as you know, some of the workshops that we offer that you register for directly through Council Connect and directly on your account will be recorded automatically on your account. However, those ones that we are co-facilitating or you receive a separate link to register, those, it's your responsibility to actually log in and record them on your council connect. They will not be appearing automatically. So this is why I'm here. I'm gonna do a quick demo just to show you how it's done in case um, you haven't seen the continuing education section on your account yet. And just to get you more comfortable with doing that. Okay, so you should be able to see my screen now. So um, you, pretty, you should be pretty familiar with uh, the outlook of your Council Connect account. I'm pretty sure everyone at this point has already logged into the Council Connect and you should be pretty familiar with the certifications and applications and courses and exam sections. So continue education, it's a little bit hidden. So you need to click on renew because technically continue education section is a part of your next renewal cycle. So at this point you need to actually click on renew and pretend like you're actually renewing your certification. There we go. And so one of the sections will actually say continue education and it will have a little pencil button on it. So you actually look into click on that. So, and once you've done that, it will show you the whole section. It will show you the chart and it will actually outlay all the credits that you have so far. Um, and it will tell you how many reported and then how many required. With all the credits you've already reported, you have an ability to go ahead and edit those. So in case you're uh, recording any of the uh, training, any of the certifications, anything that um, you've done in the past, and if you do not remember any of the information, you will be able to actually go back and change that information. So, and in order to start recording something, you're looking to click on this button that says report CE. Then the next thing, you're looking to select a category of your credit. So, I'm going to use today's example. So that will be a formal category because this is the invitation that you're receiving and the webinar that you're attending is facilitated by third parties. So that would be a webinar. With the CE provider, you're looking to uh, type in the name of the company that you're taking it with. So 
whether it's uh, CSA, ECA, um, just any of the providers, it could be Safety Codes Council. So um, in this case, I would type AMA plus City of Edmonton. Okay. And so in this case, you're looking to actually type in the name of the event. So it will be National Energy Codes for Buildings. This event does not spend um, over one day. So you're just looking to record today's date. And by the way, if you're recording something that's way in the past, um, you can just select any random date and then remove it pretty much and just type in whatever format. Um, just using our format, you can just type in whatever date. And for this presentation, for this webinar today, you're getting five credits. So you're looking to actually select five credits for yourself. And for documentation, um, and that, uh, that actually, in terms of documentation, we're not requiring you to, re to report and to attach something right away. So as you can see, this field down below here, it's not required. So all those fields where we're gathering information about the event that you took, they are required. However, the documentation is not, but um, we are encouraging you to actually keep track of everything that you're taking and maybe create a separate folder on your computer to make sure you have a place where you collect all the evidence of your training. Um, in case your file will get audited, we're gonna ask for that uh, verification of that. So just for you, you know, to just have one place, we're actually recommending to keep it somewhere on your computer if you do not like to attach something. If you want to upload something right away, you can definitely do that. You can actually click browse and it will allow you to at attach something from your computer. Okay, so once you're done filling that out, you can go ahead and click save. And you will see that your credits update right away. So you will see it um, on the chart. You will see it on your uh, list of your credits that you've taken. And as I said before, if you feel like you need to actually edit something, you can always just click an edit button and it will allow you to um, change any of the information uh, that, uh, you know, that you need to upload. As, a, as Tim said, he made a comment here in the group chat that um, it's easy to upload certificates, certificates immediately. You know, um, I've actually, I've experienced different uh, ways of doing that. So some, for some people, it's easier to keep it on the, on the desktop um, in a separate folder. Somebody likes to actually keep it on the Council Connect right away, but it's completely up to you. And so for each uh, discipline and for each level of discipline, you actually have the same exact continued education section. So you do not need to go into every single certification and upload your credits manually to each, each and every one because it doesn't matter which renewal button you're gonna click, it will take you to the same exact continued education section, no matter how many certification levels or certifications you have. Okay, so that is it for the demo. So uh, I'm pretty sure it explains it pretty well on how to do it. But in case you have any questions at all, you can always just send us an email. You can give us a call and we will be happy to help you with that. Um, one of the program advisors can actually guide you through the process and explain how it's done exactly. So again, if any questions, just give us a call, send us an email. We will be happy to assist you with your credits. Excellent. Thanks so much, Irina. Really appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Well, I will pass it over now to Justin and Nadil, and you guys can take it away. Oh, thank you so much, Jennifer. Thanks, Irina, for the presentation as well. Uh, so uh, it's going to be me, uh, Justin, and my uh, doing the rest of the uh, or of like this presentation. Uh, um, but I uh, uh, just want to let you know that most of the presentation will be through Justin. Uh, and, 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 and the reason, and that, that the idea is to give everyone um, uh, this practical experience of the city of Edmonton to show them that it's not mandatory for you to, to follow things that we're saying. Uh, but uh, but mainly to see what other local authorities and uh, I, uh, are doing uh, in regards to energy code and and I think this could be helpful for um, for uh, uh, the rest of the municipalities and uh, I encourage you also if you have the uh, expertise uh, uh, reach out and we can also um, 
do more presentation to show more practical experience from different municipalities. Um, uh, so uh, uh, I've worked with Justin, or we've dealt with each other, me, Justin, Phil, and, uh, and Justin Poker from uh, Calgary, and uh, also Juan from the city of Edmonton through the years, through the co-development, and through uh, some standards as we work together. Uh, so uh, it's good to be there and chat. Uh, also, if you have any question through the presentation, if you prefer through the presentation to ask the question, that's fine as well. Uh, so I'm just gonna cover uh, the application of NECB and then Justin will talk about more about the practical portion. So I'm just gonna, oh, uh, Jennifer, can we start? So that's our agenda. Uh, introduction, application to the energy code. Uh, then, uh, then Justin will uh, hop into the trend, the application reviews, the air tightness, which is a big thing, not only in this code, but actually it's a major thing in the new NECB 2020, which I'm working on right now for the adoption, uh, the 2020 codes. Uh, and then we have some time for question and discussion. Uh, housekeeping point, uh, I think uh, already Jennifer talked about it. Uh, so the, 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 again, the difference between the NACB and the uh, uh, Alberta Building Code or the National Building Code Alberta Edition is the uh, intent. So the NACB talks more or care more about the excess of energy or the use of energy versus the National Building Code is the kind of the performance which would affect later on the health and safety. Uh, so as an example would be, for example, the NACB would ask for the power demand of the ventilation fan, so it has to deal with the energy, versus National Building Code is the ventilation flow rate, so uh, uh, which is uh, uh, more to do with the, uh, uh, the performance, health and safety. Next, please. Uh, the application of the code, uh, this code for NECB 2017 applies to uh, design and construction of all new buildings described in sentence 1332, Division A of NBC, and to additions. So, um, and it does not apply to farm buildings. So, this has been a little bit modified in, or, to, or will be modified in the 2020. Uh, uh, um, uh, just to clarify that this could also apply to the alteration. Um, uh, the tricky part is uh, they added this alteration, but the tricky part is that the alteration will be mainly for those buildings who are being designed under the NECB uh, 2017 or 2011 or uh, 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 2020. So it's not randomly any uh, interior alteration. And I'm talking again about what's happening, uh, what's going to happen in the next code, not currently. Currently, all new buildings need to be uh, constructed or uh, comply with uh, the energy codes in ECB 2017. So they clarified this one um, uh, in, in the new code. It does not apply to farm building uh, as well. Next, please. As you all know, this is uh, repeated information for you, but it's good to refresh our uh, 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 minds with this one. It's uh, the energy code apply application uh, um, is only for part C four, five, and six, um, uh, uh, but not inclusive because you still can use the part nine. We will in the next slide. We will see that and classified as post disaster building used for measure occupancy A, B, F one which as you know most of those are part three buildings so NECB uh, needs to be uh, uh, applied. Next please. So in summary any building under part three building which are buildings greater than 600 meters square or exceeding three stories uh, also group uh, C, D, E, F2 and F3 all occupancies uh, of group A, B and F1 uh, building outside the scope of section 936. So that's where we, although it's a part nine, but for example, if you have an F2 occupancy, F2 occupancy under part nine cannot be uh, complied under 936. You need to take this building, design it under NECB uh, at 2017. 
Uh, also group D, E, F, and 3, because they exceed the floor area limit, not the, the building area, but the floor area limit. Once you exceed the 300 meters square, you need to take this building and take it to the NACB to uh, 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 comply with all the requirements of NACB, including part four and five, the lighting and all the rest of the requirements. Next, please. Uh, NACB only applies to new floor area and does not trigger upgrade to an existing building. And we've explained this uh, upgrades during renovation to mechanical system, electric system, or the building envelope are not required to meet any CB requirements uh, and cannot reduce the performance compared to the existing building. So, so basically, if you have um, a, um, if you have an existing box that is enough to supply uh, all the air. Uh, terminals to your building, if you're doing an addition or you're doing renovation, I do not need to upgrade this device. Uh, but once you add in another device, another box, another rooftop unit, for example, uh, this rooftop unit needs to be upgraded to the efficiency required as per NACB uh, 2017. Um, I will now turn it to Justin. Uh, if Justin have, if uh, Justin uh, have some time, maybe I can throw some uh, some of the uh, new top ticket items of the NSB 2020, which include the tiers, include uh, some uh, uh, upgraded performance for the uh, walls, glazing, things related to that. So uh, thank you for listening. And now I turn it to Justin. Go ahead, Justin. Perfect. Thanks, Nabil. And yeah, feel free to jump in with any of the new 2020 stuff whenever uh, you feel like it. So now that we've uh, covered where it is for new and existing buildings, I wanted to talk a little bit about NECB and tenant improvements. So tenant improvements to core and shell buildings are a little bit different, even though they're kind of existing buildings. Uh, for a lot of commercial retail and warehouse spaces, the corn shell building is constructed and then individual spaces are finished at a later date to suit a specific tenant's needs. And the types of tenants can vary and the space types within their spaces can vary as well. Sometimes it's office, sometimes it's retail, sometimes it's a warehouse, sometimes it's a mix of everything. And often the information uh, detailing the lighting and HVAC systems is often not known at the time that the corn shell building is constructed uh, for the tenant improvements. Another thing that can complicate the tenant improvement is if the corn shell building is constructed under one version of the NECB, so 2011 for example, and the tenant improvement is constructed later under a new version of the NECB. So the tenant improvement must follow the current in force version of the NECB for elements that were not complete during the corn shell construction. So if the corn shell was done under 2011 and the tenant fit outs weren't completed, then the fit outs have to be 2017. Uh, another thing to remember is that the NECB applies to the tenant improvement because the building is not complete. Even though it's sort of an existing building, the building wasn't finished. So the tenant improvement is not considered a renovation. So how do we design our buildings to make the process easy for tenants who are often on tight budgets to complete their tenant improvement later on? Uh, the best practice that we've been suggesting for corn shell buildings uh, is to avoid issues during the tenant improvement is to assume that all unknowns, so anything not designed or constructed during the corn shell, follows the prescriptive requirements of the NECB regardless of the compliance path. So even if you're going prescriptive, trade-off, performance, any unknowns uh, are done to the prescriptive path. This way tenants can just use the prescriptive path during the improvement and they might likely won't have to pay the money to do another performance model, even if the performance path was used during the uh, corn shell. So typically it's lighting, HVAC, and service hot water systems that are included in the tenant improvements. There are very rarely changes to the exterior building envelope. Occasionally there's a new door uh, or something put in, um, but not too often that I've seen in my experience. So if the corn shell building followed the prescriptive and trade-off path, and there's no change to the process uh, to use the prescriptive or trade-off path for the tenant improvement. But if the performance path was used for the corn shell, then there's some details that need to be considered. Um, so the key thing is that all items 
in the intended improvement, uh, typically lighting, HVAC, and service hot water are modeled identical in the proposed and referenced building models. I usually recommend using the prescriptive values just because they're uh, easily accessible in the NECB, but other values can be used provided that they are the same. Um, if they're modeled identical in both models, then that means there's no trade-offs necessary with the building envelope or other systems uh, to comply with the NECB. So for example, I didn't need to trade off uh, my lighting systems to make up for a uh, lower performing building envelope. And if we do it this way, where we're modeling things identical in the proposed and reference buildings, it doesn't matter what type of spaces uh, are in the tenant fit up. So for example, say the corn shell buildings model with a lighting power density of eight watts per uh, square meter in both the proposed and reference models. So since they don't know, uh, since they didn't know what kind of space the tenant would be, there are no lighting savings claimed because we're using the same value in the proposed and reference models. Uh, so say the tenant ends up being a retail sales area, which allows 13.1 watts per square meter per the NECB. They can just then follow the prescriptive path and use that prescriptive value of 13.1 square meters since no lighting savings were claimed uh, in the core and shell model. Uh, so there was one question, I'll just take this one while we're here. Uh, does a change of occupancy use also require the use of the current energy code? I think that'd be hard to determine the existing conditions to be sufficient, but they could be. As long as they're not adding floor area and it's not an addition, then the code wouldn't apply. It's just to any new floor area or any new additions. All right, uh, next I wanted to talk about exceptions to the NECB. Uh, so rarely is there a building that's fully exempt from the requirements of the NECB, even unconditioned buildings where the building envelope uh, requirements and HVAC requirements don't apply could still have uh, lighting systems where NECB requirements would apply. And we see this in some uh, just outdoor storage buildings where they don't have an HVAC and it's just basically a metal envelope, but they still have uh, lighting power systems where NECB would apply. So some portions of the code may be granted an exemption by the authority having jurisdiction uh, from requirements of the NECB if the nature of the occupancy makes it impractical to apply. Too expensive or too small is not a valid reason, and we hear that one from time to time. Uh, operational exemptions, such as, uh, let's say you have a car wash and during peak operation hours, your doors are open all the time. That's not a valid reason to get an exemption from the NECB. The building still loses a significant amount of heat at night when it's not in use and there's nobody going in and out. Uh, winters do get pretty cold here and that poor building is just sitting there um, trying to keep itself warm. So any new floor area greater than 10 square meters is subject to NECB requirements. So some examples of exemptions that we've seen in the past, uh, we've given uh, exemption for the FDWR or window to wall ratio, exemption for transit centers for safety reasons. A uh, high level of glazing was required for uh, the project as a crime deterrent at these stations. Uh, the second is uh, FDWR exemption for a vestibule addition. Uh, this case was allowed since the amount of glazing was equal to what previously existed. Um, on the building which had no vestibule. They're just basically bringing it out to go flush with the rest of the building facade. Uh, the third is a skylight exemption for a greenhouse. A uh, greenhouse with an opaque roof really wouldn't be great for growing plants. So that was uh, went directly against what the building was intending to do. So in all of these cases, all the other building envelope, lighting, HVAC and hot water requirements still applied. So we generally ask applicants to provide justification uh, to specific NECB clauses if they're looking for an exemption. So we're asking what clause you're looking for and a justification for it, not just we want to be exempt from the NECB. And I just wanted to dive a little bit into 936 on some related topics here as well. Um, so the graphic on this slide summarizes the, basically the table found in uh, A93613. The NECB can be applied to any building. However, the NECB 
uh, requirements are more extensive than 936. So the majority of applicants uh, tend to choose 936 where possible. So 936 applies to buildings under 300 square meters. The prescriptive path can be used for C, D, E, and F3 occupancies. And the performance path can be used for houses with or without a secondary suite or a building with dwelling units and common spaces, which make up less than 20% of the building area. Uh, application of 936 to existing buildings is a little bit different from applying any CV to existing buildings. In 936, existing items not in the scope of construction can remain as is. If components are being removed and upgraded or new, they must comply with 936 where reasonable. Uh, one factor in determining if this is reasonable, re if it is reasonable to comply with the 936 requirement is if uh, the requirement will increase the scope of work and how significantly. The code is not intended to retroactively apply new requirements to existing buildings. Um, some jumping into 936 exemptions. Uh, exemptions in 936 are usually related to seasonal or unconditioned buildings. Uh, the definition of a conditioned building that we've been using is that a conditioned space typically has an automatic way to control temperature, such as a thermostat, a heater which operates on an on off switch that a the homeowner can just flick on and off, wouldn't count as it doesn't respond to the outdoor temperature. If a seasonal or unconditioned space is uh, adjacent to a conditioned space, then the assembly separating the conditioned space still must meet the applicable 936 requirements. So as an example, heated garages are considered unconditioned since they're seasonally heated and often not controlled by a thermostat. It's typically an on-off switch that a homeowner can flick on and off. Uh, insulation requirements in 925 to 1 uh, still apply. So now that we have an idea of where 936 and the NACB apply, I want to talk about uh, what we've seen from commercial and residential permits and how that can help us uh, review applications. So the data for this next section of the presentation was taken from 76 commercial permits and a sample, a 370 home sample of the just shy of 4,000 residential permits that we received last year. So this graph shows which path applicants chose to demonstrate with the NECB uh, when the 2011 code was in force, which is the blue bars, uh, versus when the 2017 code was in force, which is the red bars. So we can see that there is a pretty big jump in performance path submissions from 54 to 67% going from 2011 to 2017, and a large decrease in prescriptive path going from uh, 29 down to 13%. So there's definitely a more performance path submissions coming through with the new code, and I'd expect that uh, to increase with future code cycles as well. So here's all of the NECB permits in a column chart, all 76 of them. So all the prescriptive and trade-off submissions are 0% since they're assumed to exactly meet code. So that makes up the first third or so of the graph there. Um, so that makes our median NECB compliance 3% better than code and the average uh, compliance is about 6.6 .6 better than code. Since the average is higher than the median, that means a few permits are pulling up the average. In this case, this data includes a net zero project, which was nearly 50% better than code. If we look at just the performance path and compare NECB 2011 to NECB 2017 submissions, we see that the average compliance dropped from 11.6% better than code uh, for NECB 2011 to 104 uh, for 2017, which makes sense since the 2017 code is uh, more stringent than 2011. And this chart uh, just breaks down the average compliance by building type, which I thought would be interesting to see. Sorry, Justin, uh, yeah. sorry for interrupting you. Just a question for the benefit of the group. So uh, um, when you mentioned, uh, if you go uh, back on the slides, two slides or so, the one that talks about uh, another one maybe. Uh, yeah, so we have the prescriptive, we have the trade-off and we have the performance. Uh, can you just give us a quick, quick uh, summary about how do you do the process of the plan examination for, for let's say, a CRU uh, building for a prescriptive? Do you guys go 
uh, with all the new stuff in the NECB, the 2017 NECB, which is the chi and chi and whatever and phi, and the uh, line to, uh, on the uh, around the windows and the line of the roof and uh, the Bridge Columbia uh, uh, Excel sheet. Do you guys go in depth and do calculations, or how do you how do you go through uh, uh, through it? Yeah, so the prescriptive path we have. Um some checklists that we use to kind of base our reviews off of. So they're available on, we have them posted on our Energy Code website and I think they were provided by uh, you guys or uh, NRCAN, somebody started them originally. So we use that and kind of go through it line by line to um, check to see that each item was met. And then um, we look for supplemental calculations relating to thermal bridging, which I'll get into in a, fair bit of detail uh, in a couple of sections of this presentation because that's a, a big part of what we're looking for. So it's going through those checklists, looking what can be looked at during plans examination. There's some items in the energy code that you're not going to see um, on a plan that you might see in the field, specifically around uh, insulation and things like that, where often, especially in uh, some of the CRUs, the specifications don't go into uh, a ton of detail or there's not a ton of detail on the drawing related to some of those fine details that you'd see on site so yeah we we do what we can go through the code and then uh, do what we can in the field as well thanks thanks justin yeah all right okay so the other thing i wanted to find out from the permit data was the breakdown of energy use between heating, cooling, lighting, and fan power, and so on for the end uses in a building. So in this chart, we can see that space heating on average makes up 63% of the building's annual energy use. And the second highest annual energy use is lighting at an average of 10% of the building's annual energy use. And I'll get uh, into why this is important a little bit later on in the presentation. I also wanted to find out what buildings uh, that comply with the NECB 2017 had in common. So uh, anything that goes above and beyond what is required by code to improve the energy performance of, the, of a building, it's called an energy conservation measure or ECM. So most buildings that comply with uh, NECB 2017 have one of these ECMs. So a heat recovery ventilator, uh, this helps to reduce heating energy by preheating incoming outdoor air, which um, as we saw on the last slide, heating energy is one of the largest energy end uses. So measures that reduce heating energy make a, a larger impact, um, decreasing the overall energy performance of our buildings. Uh, they generally would have, or they'd have uh, effective R16 to R18 walls. So this includes the impact of thermal bridging and most walls will typically have a few uh, inches of exterior insulation as well as interior insulation. Uh, they'll have double glazed windows with non-metallic spacers or triple pane windows with aluminum frames, something a little uh, more high performance, or they'll have a low window to wall ratio, somewhere around the 10 to 12% if they, the wall assemblies are a little bit weaker. Since glazing is the weakest part of the building envelope, uh, increasing the window to wall ratio also uh, can significantly increase the annual heating energy consumption as it goes up. So I did the same kind of analysis for the 936 permits as well. So here's the comparison of the energy path followed when the 2014 code was enforced. So the blue bars uh, versus the 2019 code, which is the red bars. And we didn't see as much of a change here. There was a little bit of an uptick in trade-off submissions and a little bit of a decrease actually in the performance path. But given that there weren't significant changes to 936 between the 2014 and 2019 code, this really isn't too surprising. So I mentioned that there were about 370 permit submissions that I looked at for this analysis. Uh, in this particular data set, there was uh, also 137 unique builders across those 370 permits. So this uh, pie chart has two pies. Uh, the inner pie here is the breakdown of the prescriptive trade-off and performance and enter guide submissions. And the outer pie represents an individual builder for that 
particular path. So we can see that nearly half the performance path submissions were completed by just seven builders and uh, one builder made up nearly all the trade-off submissions. So there's some, uh, definitely some volume builders out there and uh, each one has their preferences on the path. So this again is all the permits plotted on one chart. Uh, as I mentioned before, the prescriptive and trade-off are 0% better than code and make up the first third or so of the data. Uh, median compliance with the code is 4.7% and the average compliance is 6.4, which means that some high scores were again bringing the average up. And just looking at the performance path, uh, we can see that the average percent better than code jumped up from 8% when 2014 was enforced to 10% when the 2019 code came into effect, which is good to see that things are um, moving forward a little bit. And here's the breakdown of energy end uses in a 936 application. Again, space heating energy was by far the dominant end use coming in at 54%. Uh, domestic hot water was just shy of 18% and lights and appliances were around 21%, which is still a pretty decent uh, chunk of the overall energy consumption, um, especially when you compare it to NECB, which space heating was by far the highest and then lighting it was 10% as the second highest one. So some of the common energy conservation um, measures to meet 936 include a lower to window, lower window to wall ratio, uh, usually ranging from eight to 14%, high efficiency furnaces, so going for a 95 or 96% efficient furnace versus uh, prescriptive value, and higher performance windows with a USI value lower than 1.6, which is uh, triple, typically triple glazed or um, with non-metallic frames. All right, so now that I've given an overview of some of the application trends, I want to talk about application reviews. Uh, the purpose of a review is to verify that the submission complies with the chosen energy code path, whether it's prescriptive, trade-off, or performance. And some energy code items may not be shown on the plans and can only be verified during inspections. So the last three points on the slide are uh, more related to the performance path specifically, which makes up the bulk of the permit submissions as we saw earlier on. So no energy model is perfect. Uh, there's hundreds of inputs and even the best modelers make mistakes once in a while. The important thing is to ask whether there are any errors that are significant enough to bring the building out of compliance. Uh, when I was energy modeling in the past, I would always recommend a buffer of a few percent in case anything changes during construction or if a minor error occurred. And this way we'd be safe and we wouldn't uh, run the risk of the building uh, going out of compliance. And the margin of compliance also plays a role in the level of review detail for submission. The smaller the margin of improvement of the proposed building over the reference building, uh, the higher level of review. If it's only complying by a couple of percent or even a couple of tenths of a percent, which I've seen, um, then even a minor error could bring the building out of compliance. So what I've developed uh, for our team here in Edmonton is a NACB review checklist with some items that would make the biggest difference in energy performance if they're missed or if the data is entered incorrectly. We saw earlier in the presentation that heating energy is the most dominant energy end use uh, here in Alberta. So this means that any mistakes or emissions of items related to heating energy, which made up on average 60% of the total annual energy consumption, will be more significant than mistakes or emissions of items related to something like cooling, which only makes up 1% of the total annual energy consumption. So in no particular order, here are some of the items that are on our checklist. Uh, one of them being verifying wall assembly USI or RSI values. The walls generally make up the most surface area of the building and an incorrect USI or RSI value can make a significant difference in heating energy. Uh, next is verifying glazing USI values. Um, there's a lot of different combinations of glazing out there. So I had compiled a chart of common glazing configurations that our team could use to check to see if the U value claimed in an energy model uh, is reasonable for what's shown on the drawings. So for example, your average double pane, argon filled, aluminum frame, glazing assembly ranges 
depending on the uh, framing manufacturer, somewhere between a USI of 2.4 to 2.7. So if we saw a USI value lower than 2.4 um, on an application, we can dig into a little bit further to uh, why that is. Outdoor airflow rates should be the same in the proposed and reference buildings. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to heat up our minus 30 winter air to a nice cozy indoor temperature. So it's important that these values are the same to not give uh, your proposed or reference model an advantage over the other one. And heat recovery uh, is included in the reference model where applicable. Uh, this is a big one, and especially in 2017, uh, the heat recovery requirements changed a little bit. So remember that code determines if heat recovery is required by the ventilation system flow rate. So if there's any supplemental heaters, just like unit heaters with often very high flow rates, you can't include these thousands of liters per second of supplemental air when it's not really um, part of the ventilation system there. So next is to ensure that thermal bridging is accounted for. Thermal bridging can make a very significant difference in heating energy, and we'll talk more about this in the next section. Uh, we look at proposed and reference lighting power densities that their calculated property and lighting controls are accounted for. We look to see that the reference building uh, window to wall ratio is set to the appropriate value. As I mentioned before, glazing is the weakest point of the envelope and a few percent uh, change can make a difference. And we also have some minor items to check uh, for buildings that comply by small margins of a couple percent, but I won't get into every single one here. All right, so next I wanted to talk about uh, the changes to the thermal bridging requirements from NACB 2011 to NACB 2017, as they made uh, quite a difference in energy performance of the building. So as a refresher, a thermal bridge is a weak point in a building envelope involving a conductive element, like a steel wall stud or a Z-gert, where heat can more easily flow out of the building uh, compared to an insulated section of the building envelope. So there's two examples on this slide. The colorful image on the left shows a steel stud wall assembly. The color coding shows the temperature at various points in the wall assembly. So red is warm, Blue is cold and yellow is somewhere in between. Ideally, we'd like to see as much red as possible, which then that means we're not losing heat through the envelope. But we can see in this image some yellow where the steel studs are, which shows a lower temperature. And that's where the thermal bridge where more heat loss occurs through the stud. On the image on the right, we can see that this balcony slab runs from the straight through from the interior of the building to the exterior of the building without any break in the slab. So he can very easily escape through the inside just by going down uh, and through between the two floors there. So this detail is a source of significant heat loss in multifamily uh, residential building types. So here's the thermal bridging clause right out of NECB 2017. Uh, in NECB 2011, we really only had to account for the items in clause A, which were studs and joists. And the items in clauses B, C, and D are new to NACB 2017. So we now have to account for major structural elements that penetrate or intersect the building envelope, uh, such as balconies and junctions between the assemblies that are listed in clause C there. We can break down all of these types of thermal bridges into three types. Uh, there's clear field, uh, linear, and point transmittances. So clear field transmittance is the items that we accounted for in NECB 2011 and continue to do so in 2017, such as wall assemblies. So wall studs, uh, Z-girts or other components supporting insulation. Clear field transmittances are basically your wall assemblies or roof assemblies and are measured in square meters. So we're just looking at a uh, wall or roof area. Linear transmittance items are things like parapet transitions, uh, balconies, and corner interfaces. Uh, going back to the balcony, we don't really care about the total surface area of the balcony, just the length of that part um, where the building transitions from the interior to the exterior where the heat is escaping. So the longer or wider that balcony is, the more heat we're losing through the slab uh, from the interior to the exterior of the building. So linear transmittances are measured in meters. Uh, the last one is point transmittances. 
these are the least common and be something like a beam penetration. And since they're usually small, we don't measure them in area or length, just the quantity. So how do we account for these types of thermal bridgings in our prescriptive trade-off and performance uh, models? What we've been asking for here is the BC Hydro Thermal bridging, bridging Spreadsheet or a document with the equivalent information. This sheet is set up well to account for all three of these types of transmittances. So all I have to do is enter the areas, lengths, or quantities, and corresponding transmittance values from uh, which you can find in literature such as the ASHRAE handbooks or BC Hydro Thermal Bridging Guide. And it will give you an effective value to use for the whole building or the orientation, uh, similar to how we get uh, effective RSI values from the tables in the appendix of part nine. Uh, so just uh, to refresh uh, the difference between nominal and effective R values, uh, nominal is uh, the value of the assembly not accounting for thermal bridging and effective accounts for thermal bridging. Uh, so you can consider a two by six wood stud filled with R19 bat insulation. The nominal value not accounting for thermal bridging is R19 and the effective value once we count uh, for thermal bridging through the studs is R14. So we'll do an example right after this, but here is a clip of the thermal bridging spreadsheet and this image is taken from uh, one of the pieces of information on our website to help applicants complete their NECB applications. Um, so for each component, we ask for a description of the assembly or a reference to assembly in the drawings. So we'll name it W1. Then we ask for the area that W1 uh, covers, then the USI value of W1, a uh, reference to either that ASHRAE or thermal bridging guide to back up the value, uh, USI value. And then in the notes, we ask for a reference or a section view of the assembly so we can verify where it came from. So I think this is uh, easier to explain an example. So let's do that. Let's say our building has just one wall type called W1, and there is 200 square meters of W1. This building also has some balconies with a total length along the exterior of 20 meters. And we'll say that W1 is made up of an interior steel stud wall filled with bad insulation, and there's 50 millimeters or two inches of exterior rigid insulation supported by vertical Z girts. So what we're trying to find is an effective USI value that captures the thermal bridging through the steel studs, the Z girts, and the balconies. And for this example, I'm going to use the values from the BC Hydro Thermal Bridging Guide. What we want to do is find our assembly in the guide. So the bottom left picture shows our interior and exterior insulated assembly. And on the right side is a table from the same page with effective USI values uh, based on how much exterior insulation we have. So we know that rigid insulation is usually R5 per inch, so it'd be R10 total in this case. If we go to the third row of that table on the right, uh, we see that R10 exterior insulation gives us a USI of 0 0.35, which is highlighted in the red box. So that's a value we'll use in our spreadsheet. The second piece of information we need is the balcony transmittance value. Again, we can go to that uh, BC Hydro Thermal Bridging Guide, find a detail that matches or is close to our balcony detail. And for this case, we'll say that the balcony is insulated uh, outbound of the envelope by 0.4 meters. Uh, so we can look at the third row. We can see uh, that's for balcony insulation 0.4 meters from the wall. And going all the way to the right, we can see that the transmittance value is 0.529, which is highlighted in the red box. And we'll use that in our spreadsheet as well. So we'll take those two values, and this is what a completed spreadsheet would look like. So we can see in the first row for the clear field, um, we see in the fourth column that it's called W1, because that's the assembly we're looking at. We can see in the next column that we had 200 square meters of it. And the column after we have the USI value that we found of 0.35. A couple columns over from that, I have a reference to the detail from the guide that I used, so detail 5.1.5. And finally, in the notes, it describes where I can find a description of this assembly. And for the balcony, uh, on the second row, we can see that it's a linear interface. Um, it's called balcony because that's what we're looking at. We have 20 meters of length of balcony in our building, and the transmittance value that we found from the guide is 0.529. Again, I have references to the guide where I found this detail 
and a reference to a drawing section where I can see the balcony details. So this sheet then generates a new USI value that we can use as part of our building permit submission. Um, in this case, the overall USI value accounting for thermal bridging through the studs, zedgerts, and balconies is 0 0.403. If this was any CB 2011, we wouldn't need to account for that balcony, just the thermal bridging in the wall. So we could have just used that value of 0.35 that we found from the guide. Um, but including that balcony makes a 15% difference in heat loss, which is uh, fairly significant. So where do we use this value? Uh, for the prescriptive path, we know that the maximum USI value allowed for walls in climate zone seven is 0.21. So since 0.403 exceeds 0.21, the assembly is not compliant and isn't acceptable to use in the prescriptive path. In the trade-off path, we would use this USI value for the wall in our trade-off calculations. Uh, so I put a very simple trade-off calculation at the bottom of this slide, so we can see where that value of 0 0.403 is used in our trade-off calculation. So we're using that for the walls in our proposed building. And in the performance path, we would use the USI value in our energy model. Uh, you could use it to represent all the walls in a small project, you could do it by orientation, like each modeler may use slightly different approaches, um, but the, you, you'll find a way to uh, incorporate that into your energy model. Uh, so I wanted to talk uh, about some common errors that we see in NACB submissions. Uh, often thermal bridging calculations are just missing from applications. This occurs more often in prescriptive or trade-off submissions where they may not have an energy professional uh, on the project. As we saw, excluding thermal bridging items uh, can make a significant difference in energy performance. Uh, some of the information required by DIVC222 is often also missed. There's plenty of people out there who just hit print on eQuest e -quest or CanQuest outputs, send them off and call it a day, which misses some of the information uh, required from DIVC. Uh, Obviously, these are harder to review than well put together reports. Um, a nice report with everything laid out is a lot easier to look at than uh, a mess of energy model software outputs. Uh, fan power is also occasionally modeled incorrectly, which results in excessive savings. Uh, we see this sometimes in constant volume HVAC systems where fan power savings are 50, 60 percent. Um, like so there are times when your fan power and motors are smaller than the reference building, but usually it's variable speed ones that generate the high savings. Uh, constant volume usually isn't uh, as high. So just something to watch out for. On the 936 side for errors, it's usually inconsistency between construction documents, the 936 checklists, site-specific engineering, and the energy model report. That's the most common error that we see. If the energy model ends up using more stringent values than what's um, on the drawings, so for example, if the model used 12 inch on center studs, but they were actually 16 in the final design, that's not a, as big of a deal because, um, you know, there's less thermal bridging with 16 on center instead of 12. Um, but if it was the opposite and it was modeled with 16 in reality, it's 12, then there's a, an issue there and it needs to be looked at again. Uh, some modelers use incorrect values for the solar heat gain coefficient, uh, wall uh, effective thermal resistant values, and roof ETR values in the reference model. So just something to double check. And finally, furnace output and fan sizing is occasionally done incorrectly, which leads to excess fan power savings. Uh, and we also see that air barrier continuity and insulation continuity are also items that are missed occasionally. Um, this basement foundation wall detail is one that's often missed and the items that's missed is the insulation in the red box here. Um, without that piece of insulation, there isn't continuity of insulation from your basement to your above grade walls. So it just needs to be in there as well. So air barriers are another area where 936 applicants occasionally struggle. So there's three options for air barriers there. There's one prescriptive, op prescriptive option, and then there's two options which involve uh, testing in one way or another. 
um, looking at the performance path specifically, here's a summary of what values should be used in an energy model based on the clause followed. So the more stringent clause out of uh, our options there allow an air change rate of two and a half, which matches the reference building, so there's no disadvantage. And the less stringent uh, re requirements, you have to use a value of 3.2, which ends up putting you at a bit, bit of a disadvantage when you're completing your model. But applicants also have the option to use the tested value from a blower door test, which uh, is rarely used. But going back to before, heating energy is the largest energy end use uh, here in Alberta. And infiltration through leaky assemblies contributes uh, a pretty major part of that overall heating energy. So testing can help to show significant heating energy savings and help a building exceed 936 requirements. And I was curious to see how much of a difference that would make. So basically for every air change um, that you reduce your leakage rate by, that's a 7% reduction in your overall energy consumption, which is huge, not just heating energy, like overall. And as I mentioned, builders following 936 can take credit for improved air tightness, uh, which I think is probably one of the cheaper ways to improve energy performance since you don't need a ton of new material by putting on more and more insulation. So this only applies to 936 right now, but there was a proposed change in the 2020 code to allow any CB users to take credit for improved air tightness uh, as well. So speaking of that, the 2020 codes are expected to be released by the end of this year and barring any changes to the current process, they'll come into effect uh, a year from now per our auto adoption legislation. From what I saw in the proposed changes, the codes are expected to be 15%, 15 to 20% more stringent than the current codes. And given the median compliance values that we saw for our uh, NECB and 936 submissions, we're likely to see some innovative approaches to meeting the more stringent codes. So that's all I had to say. Nabil, did you have anything else you wanted to add before we jump into the questions and discussion? No, that, that's actually, that's great. Thank you so much, Justin. I just wanna, uh, because people will get scared uh, about, because um, Justin is a, is a code specialist um, and he's an engineer and he's a, mechanical, he's a mechanical engineer. He did a lot of modeling before even joining uh, Edmonton. And, but we have to be careful. There is a difference between a big organization like the city of Edmonton or Calgary or uh, Grand, like th there is a lot of big organization in Alberta, but there is also a smaller municipalities, which uh, they barely have two or three uh, safety code officers, sometimes one or two, or sometimes actually even the uh, the contract uh, their safety codes to uh, 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 an agency. Um, so what's what Justin have mentioned is very typical, very like very uh, optimum. Um, uh, this doesn't mean that you have to, um, of course, it's going to be great if you examine uh, piece by piece. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, compliance is a great, it's, 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 it's the main thing. That's why we have the presentation now. Uh, 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 but, uh, but, but my question to you, Justin, let me just start the question, the question from myself here uh, about uh, if I don't have if I don't have much uh, resources, like I don't have, I don't have time. I'm a, let me just put myself, I, I work in a small municipality. I don't have time. I have, I have to do permits under 936. I have to do permits under uh, part three and whatever. I have to go building and uh, do some inspections. I have to uh, 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 reply to some phone calls and being bugged by, by a lot of architects and engineers like me and you uh, and so on. What are the big ticket items that you would suggest? Uh, um, uh, because I mean, if you if we're gonna do the calculation uh, or check the calculation, it's it's a big deal for me to do it as a as a one or two building inspector. What's the big ticket items that I need to check? Yeah, and that's a great point and great question. Um, as you mentioned, you know, I I do this full time is looking at the energy code stuff and green building and thinking about energy all day and making up review checklists and putting in the details. And I'm grateful that we have the resources to be able to do that. Um, but if I 
had to focus on specific things. It would just be going back to the big ticket items that make the biggest difference in energy performance. So during plans review, like I mentioned, looking at the stuff around heating energy, so making sure the building envelopes good, the mechanical systems is, uh, those two things are the two biggest parts that contribute to the energy of your building. And looking at all the other little details like pumping energy and insulation and all site, like in the grand scheme of things, it makes a difference in energy performance, but not nearly as big of a difference as uh, those envelope components. And getting quality uh, applications from uh, people in industry is another thing that uh, really saves a lot of time. Um, like I mentioned, some uh, applications, we just see somebody print out like 200 pages of output from an energy model report. And even as an experienced energy modeler, um, it's very time consuming to go through all of those inputs, especially like an eQuest where it's broken down by like uh, face and assembly. So you end up having like, I don't know, you can have a lot depending on the size of the buildings. So having that uh, summary, having the checklists where you can quickly see like that big picture of what the application's doing and just kind of look for the big red flags and dive into the details rather than just uh, trying to dive in the details right off the start. So it's super helpful to have good applications and then focus on those big ticket items like um, envelope and HVAC, which I mean, we're trying to reduce energy consumption. That's the point of the code. So um, yeah, focusing on that, I think would be the most helpful. So would it be safe to say that um, if it's a model, if it's a modeling, uh, if it's like a repetitive uh, firm, uh, would it be safe to say that I don't really need to, I don't want to say <laughs> to check much in the report or can I just get the report and say, okay, it's, that's, that's good. And uh, as a safety code officer, which I don't have time, can I just say it's good and go from there? Or there is something that I would really want to have a look. For example, if he did the uh, the modeling under the NCB 2017 or some stuff like that, what, what, what do you think? Uh, yeah, and I think that's okay. So the other thing that I should have mentioned in the first answer is that we look at, is if we're looking at a model, it, it depends on how much the building complies by as well. If it's like 15 or 20% better than code and nothing okay. looks outrageous in terms of values, then I wouldn't spend much time on it. Be like, oh, okay, there's a, a huge bunker. Yeah. It'll be probably be offset. A... Yeah. The... yeah. Um, but if it's right. complying by like half a percent, then I might spend a little bit more time just to, look, again, look at the big items to make sure that they're somewhat in line. I mean, you don't need to nitpick every little detail and I don't either. Just using kind of the judgment, if it's complying by a good margin, then don't spend as much time on it. If it's a smaller margin, then take a look at those big ticket items and investigate further if you need to. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful, no thanks, that's, that's good. So uh, I think maybe back to uh, Jennifer, if there is some question that we can see or, uh, or if there's any question from the crowd. Um, uh, otherwise yeah. I may, yeah. Uh, So I had uh, one question uh, directly sent to me. So it was a question about uh, certification requirements to become an energy modeling, uh, to do energy modeling or become a professional qualified. So I have my building energy modeling professional credential, which is offered through ASHRAE. Um, so they have study guides and courses available to uh, kind of help you through it, but it does require a lot of uh, energy modeling experience to kind of get through it. A lot of um mechanical engineering firms have offer energy modeling there's some 936 firms so just looking into uh, things like that would be helpful and there are some courses out there that offer energy modeling training they're a little bit uh, difficult to find uh, sometimes but if you keep your eyes open sometimes cagbc offers it sometimes um uh, i think there's actually like a course out there too um from you at BCIT, I think, or one of the BC universities. So there's there's options out there to help it. But there's also free tools. So you can always just download eQuest, Energy Plus, or something like that and just get to it. 
Perfect. So Jennifer, do you have any questions that we can see? I don't have any other ones in the chat right now. If anybody has one, feel free to pop it in there or if there's one higher up that I missed. Um, I think yeah. they were all addressed so far. Yeah, and you can always feel free to. Yeah, oh, in regards ahead. to the, uh, sorry, just to go ahead, sorry. I was just gonna say like, if uh, always feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to talk about energy anytime too. Email is up on the slide, so feel free to shoot me an email anytime. Yeah, not me, just just you guys. <laughs> Why did you? <laughs> no, all good. Uh, I think you have a question here. There you go. Do the increased energy requirements affect dew point issues in wall assemblies? Yeah, and I think that's something that's not specifically addressed in the energy codes, since they basically just set your RSI or USI values to be like meet a certain minimum level and doesn't it be up to the uh, designer to do their checks to make sure that there's no dew point issues in the wall assemblies so i know yeah. you have a certain ratio of inboard to outboard insulation you can do uh your dew point analysis as well to make sure that you're not going to run into issues but uh, i don't know if you had anything else bad yeah, the, 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 uh, the, that's a very good question because, again, it's not dealt in the code, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be the designer or the architect who designed the wall assembly. Uh, mainly what we're trying to do is to push the insulation outside the wall. There is, there is some, um, if you search perfect wall in BC, they're talking about it. They, they have a guide. Um, uh, it's a good practice thing that the, 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 the suggest is to get all the insulation outside the wall, try to avoid, which is not practical, not common thing, try to avoid insulation in the stud uh, to avoid this dew point. But again, this is all recommendation outside the energy code. I hope in the future they uh, do more research about this one uh, uh, as well. I think someone's asking about the slides, if it's going to be available. I think, Justin, can we share the slides, I think? Yeah, yeah we can. no so problem. On Jennifer my would be the the one, the boss. Is, she's our boss. She's going to take care of this. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, if we have a few minutes, I also maybe I'll tell you guys, think about any question I can. Uh, uh, let me just go back, uh, me and Justin, go back to this question about the uh, the change of occupancy, which is a good question. Uh, I think the if you have a change of occupancy, let's say from a D to an A2, and it follows the same code, like uh, it was comply under the 2017 MECB, you will have some minor impacts. For example, the LBD, so the light power density, you may have to hire an electric engineer to, to check those guys for you. Uh, but overall, if you're not changing the RTU, if you're not changing, because most of the code, the energy code has been satisfied by the major, major component, like the rooftop unit, like the building envelope, like uh, the heater, uh, uh, again, if you change the, the water heater, yeah, maybe you still have to comply with the new code requirement, energy code requirements. And what's what, and that's what, um, uh, so, so your question actually uh, is now being uh, integrated in the 2020 NCB. And it talks in the appendix about, give you some uh, explanation about how to do this interior alteration that was done after the adoption. Uh, uh, for the uh, 2020 code. So this one, you will see it uh, coming uh, soon in the coming code 2020. Uh, uh, Jennifer, I think there's a question if you want to. Uh... Yes, question from Lance. How is the performance path done on row house or townhouse type buildings? Is it by the entire building or is it done unit by unit? Uh, so you could do it either way i'd probably lean toward doing it unit by unit just to be safe because there may be slight variations in uh each individual row house if they're all identical you could probably group them together you just have to kind of be careful because what the energy codes are concerned with is the transfer of heat outside the overall building envelope so not necessarily between units so even though you have a party wall 
Um, you're not really accounting for the heat transfer through those because it's gonna be the same temperature on either side anyway, so there shouldn't be much heat loss between the units. So we've seen it done both ways. Uh, it's usually uh, unit by unit that we've seen just in case there's any small variations. And plus the, you know, the end units generally have three usually exterior walls windows. instead of yeah. two in the yeah. middle. Of you, so. and, and more windows, I think, from, uh, from the side. Uh, one of the uh, same, uh, if I can, Justin, if you're done, I can uh, maybe also uh, point out about this row housing that uh, be careful because they cannot, so if it's an identical townhomes, they cannot use the same, and Justin, correct me if I'm wrong, they cannot use the same report because the orientation and the modeling usually make a big difference. Uh, if it's facing north, if it's facing west, the angle and so on. Uh, correct, Justin? Yep, 100%. So even if it's identical, we still need to ask for a different uh, energy code report for uh, each building. Yeah. Good. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, maybe check with you also about the 2020. We are working now uh, on reviewing the 2020 NCB in the province. And uh, you will, uh, what you expect, you will expect some also some, um, uh, again, the first uh, one was the uh, the interior alteration they added um, to make it clear that any interior alteration happened after the uh, building of this building, uh, uh, which uh, is complying with NECB. Uh, you need to check later on if you change of occupancy, if you did alteration, you need to check the requirement. Uh, again, it's a tough thing, again, for smaller municipalities to check all of those things. Um, the good thing that I heard that the local authority, uh, like Edmonton now are uh, uh, requesting uh, professional involvement for new spaces. Uh, they started a couple of weeks ago. So if you have a shell building, whatever the space is, I heard you guys are requesting professional involvement as per the code, uh, which is good. So an involvement would be there anyway should so that's good that will uh, um, um, avoid a lot of work on you guys to check those require the the energy code requirements the fire safety fire alarm sprint or whatever um, so one of the things is the interior alteration uh, is being clarified now in 2020 uh, we will have um, uh, Let's take the question because this should oversee my 2020 updates. Uh, Jennifer, there's another question, I think. You bet. Uh, regarding building orientation, how is building shadowing addressed, especially in the winter and in the downtown areas and mountains? Yeah, and that's a good question. It's something uh, that's not really addressed yeah, not by the code either. either. No. Um, so the code typically just looks at the building kind of in its ideal mm -hmm. by itself kind of spot so open terrain kind of yeah, yeah. And that might change like if we start talking well it becomes important when we look beyond the code and start talking about net zero homes or emissions neutral homes where we can mm -hmm. uh consider things like shadowing and you know towers and all that which makes a difference in your heating energy when you don't have that lovely solar heat gain to help your net zero building and put you at a bit of a dip advantage. Yeah, so. but it, it, I mean, uh, sorry for cutting you, Justin, it's going to be hard because now you cannot expect what's going to be, be built. Maybe you can expect what's going to be, be built in the on the same lot, but not on your neighbor from the north or the left or the side. Maybe you have a, a three, four, five, six story as per the zoning regulation, what, what they permit, or just the CRU or uh, it's 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 hard. It's a great question, but I don't think it's easy to uh, resolve this issue. But it's it's a great question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just to continue with the code updates, we also have a lower. Uh, most of the walls in twenty twenty will be the same kind of. So the R is the R value or the U value, and NCB wouldn't change much. Uh, because uh, what any uh, with NRC and NRK, they believe that the usually the horizontal surface is the one that really affects the uh, performance of the energy. 
uh, and the thermal bridging. So there is a big change in the roof and the floor in 2020. Uh, also, the light power density is different in part uh, uh, four. Uh, uh, the, the, the glazing is low as the U value is being lowered, which means it's the, the, the want you to have, uh, they want the, the developer or the designer to go with better performance window or glazing which as you know would affect the trade-off because most of the designer would uh, count on um, uh, the, uh, the, the floor, uh, uh, the, uh, the window to for every issue for the, the trade, the, the, the trading between the walls and the glazing um, uh, to make the code, the, the building comply with the NECB. So lowering the U value or raising the R value of the glazing may affect also the trade-off compliance. Uh, and that's why we're seeing, as you've seen, Justin, seeing a lot of complicated stuff about the calculation. We've seen a lot of people go into the modeling as it's an easier pass. Also for the designers, it's uh, it's really a lot of work, and it's uh, if you do a small mistake, it affects a lot of things. Uh, um, so uh, so lower lower U value for the glazing and the door. Uh, for the uh, lower U value for the anything horizontal like the roof or the uh, the floor. Um, uh, the big thing, which is part nine, uh, part ten which they added in the NSB 2020 is the tier code, which is a kind of, if you want to say step code, uh, which are giving you four tiers. Uh, the first one is the 100%, which means it's equal to the prescriptive requirement. Uh, 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 then, uh, then different uh, categories to any necessary for or 50%, I don't remember, but or 60%, but it actually, uh, give you different tiers, which the province will be, uh, most probably will be uh, choosing one of the tiers to start with. So it may not be all the option. Again, this is not 100%, uh, I'm not 100% uh, sure, but uh, we will have to uh, check with the, our uh, provincial administrator, Paul Chang and James or our director, and see how the uh, how we're gonna choose from the tiers. So uh, uh, a tiers in summary means that you can go above the building codes um, under part ten, uh, with maybe some in incentives from the municipalities, like maybe if Justin can offer some uh, incentives to the uh, uh, um, to whoever takes this pass, uh, or then maybe the zoning regulation. I don't know how it works, but. Uh, how it's going to work, but we will see in the future. So those are the um, one last thing before I, um, I, I finalize this um, update is the air leakage. And uh, um, I'm not sure, Justin, if you check those things, but there was a, a uh, there is a lot of information about an, uh, a very specific uh, requirement uh, for the air leakage. Uh, uh, if you want to jump in and let us know what are those, I know that you were worked on. You were still reading the, uh, you're still reading the the, the uh, proposed change. Um, feel free if you want to, but I know that now it has a standard and the testing requirement for each one, uh, which was vague in 2017. Yeah, and it's been a while since I read those proposed it's, changes, it's, but I mean, it's, just, it's, you could use your, uh, using a formula, you could end up using your air change, lower air change rate in your NECB model compared to the reference instead of just using the flat out 0.25. And yeah, there's a couple levels, I think in 936, where air tightness would have to improve as you went up the uh, tiers as mm -hmm. well. Good, I think, uh, uh, do we have a question, Jennifer, or? There's a couple questions. Uh, the first one is heat loss through a concrete slab a factor when designer is considering below slab insulation options? That's a good question. Yeah, uh, so the NECB outlines uh, the minimum uh, like slab insulation requirements as well for both slab on grade 
and if you have a parkade or a basement as well. And there was a comment, I think right after that, that you need heat to get to the footing to prevent frost heaving. So that's another kind of going back to the dew point question. This is uh, similar as well. The way the NECB suggests that you do insulation, like a couple feet in from the exterior could cause um, frost heaving from what I understand. So it's working with the architect uh, or the designer uh, to make sure your insulation requirements aren't going to cause any uh, frost heave or foundation issues as well. And there's, another question. there's another one there as well, asking if there's a typical design for thermal breaks at the weak point of balconies for both wood frame construction and concrete high rise. I don't know them off the top of my head, but I know I've talked to a few structural engineers who have uh, balcony designs that incorporate a thermal break. Uh, I just can't remember how they do it. You know the. They have a, a sort of a cutting view just, and I think they also have some products that they use. It's it's online. It's they're all over uh, that uh, uh, does a thermal break for any cantilever coming from any building. Um, those are old, by the way. Those are very old products, but I think they enhance them. So, yeah, go ahead, Justin. Uh, no, that was. <laughs> Uh, good. Yeah, yeah, they have a lot of products that uh, architects would uh, try to specify to the structural engineer and saying, okay, be careful, we have a problem. We have someone called Justin Fairless, so he loves energy code and he wants right. to comply 100%. So can you please help me, Mr. Structural Engineer, to do this? And they, uh, and they usually incorporate those guys, making sure everything is fine, and, uh, and they do this thermal break. Again, this is a very old practice, but they enhance the products uh, these days. Perfect, uh, back to you, Jennifer. I think me and Justin are done. Justin, do you need to have any comments? Uh, 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 so I, I'm gonna go uh, to Justin. Uh, I would like to thank you again. and thank the Safety Code Council and thanks Paul, uh, Paul Cheng, because he was the one actually when I, uh, when I ask him about uh, this presentation, uh, that we need to uh, bring some guys to give us the practical experience. Uh, he was so excited and he told me, okay, go ahead, uh, talk to uh, Justin and, and uh, let's do this. So again, thanks to, uh, to, uh, to Paul and uh, thanks to the Safety Codes Council for allowing me and Justin to uh, present today. Thank you. Yeah, and likewise, thanks for having me. Thanks, Safety Codes Council, for letting me talk about energy and in excessive detail for 45 minutes or so there. So I appreciate it. That's good. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you both for taking the time and the excellent presentation. Um, we will have, we have recorded it, as I said, so we will have it available on our website. Usually takes a couple of weeks to get it up there. So if you wanted to share it with friends or, or colleagues that would be interested or for future reference. And as well, I will ask if Justin's okay sharing the slides, uh, we can get a PDF version of that maybe for anybody sure. who's interested, yeah. just reach out and uh, let us know. But yeah, thank you everybody so much and have a great Friday and thank you for attending. Thank cool. you so much. Thank See you guys. Bye-bye.